Hello everyone, my name is Alex, I'm a 2000 rated chess player over the board classical and in today's video we're going to be making a completely objective chess opening tier list. If you disagree, you are wrong. Let's get into it. We have the advanced Karo Khan, so I'm going to assume that's from the white side we're ranking this from. I play the Karo Khan with the black side. The advanced Karo Khan, it's alright, but I think you can be a bit more creative. You can play something like on move 3 knight d2 or knight c3 it's better than the exchange so it definitely won't be too far down i'll put it on legit i think um it's probably one of the best ways for white to try and push push for an advantage but it's a little bit unimaginative in my opinion next up we've got the advanced french and here again i'm going to be taking it from the white hand side um maybe they're all really from the white side no, the, then there's like the Alakines. Anyway, the advanced French, again, I think you can be a bit more creative. Same thing with the Caro. Something like knight d2 or knight c3 is probably a bit better. It's, again, it is better than the exchange, so we have that going for it. Very similar to the advanced Caro Khan. I'm going to stick it in legit. Um, you can't go wrong with it, but I think you can do better than it. You can play some interesting gambits in those sorts of openings. Okay, next up, we've got the Alapin Sicilian. And here again, we're going to be taking it from the white side. I think the Alapin is pretty cool. Um, it gets you out of a lot of really annoying Sicilian theory, which I absolutely rate. Um, you could argue it's a bit boring, but personally, I have played it a little bit. And you can play some cool gambits against the Sicilian, which personally I like to go for. But... In fairness, it's solid. I would say it's probably unbreakable. If you need a draw or just a two-result game where you either win or draw, but most likely draw with the white pieces, great opening. You can take people out of uh, their opening knowledge with it because it's kind of like a weird strand of the Sicilian. So I'd rate it unbreakable. Next up, we have the Alakine's Defense or Aliokin, however you're supposed to pronounce it. It's... It's okay. It's okay. Um, I'm going to put it in really, bro, because, it, like, it's just bad. Like, it's not bad, but it just puts you at an instant disadvantage for absolutely no reason. Like, there's no need to be getting your knights kicked around in the center immediately when you could just not. You could just put a pawn in the center. So, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to put it in really, bro. Next up, we have the Benoni. I have mixed feelings about the Benoni. Because it's a good opening in terms of trying to do something creative and weird. Players like Bobby Fischer used to play it all the time. I feel like Modern Theory might have made it a bit less viable than it used to be, unfortunately. I have played it a little bit with okay success, going for the weird gambits with the A and B pawns on the queen side from the black perspective. I'm going to put it in really, bro. I would put it in legit. So I'm going to put it at the top of really, bro. Um, playing it in like a blitz game or a bullet game, perfect. Yeah, absolutely. But if we're talking about like rapid and classical, then I think, again, you're just putting yourself at a disadvantage for no real reason. You could just not, you know. Next up, Berlin defense. Garbage. I'm not going to say anything more about that. Bone cloud. <laughs> you can argue with me in the comments. <laughs> Um, Bone Cloud, I mean, for meme status, we can put it in Legendary. Let's look at it from a bullet perspective, um, just because I'm trying to be really generous of it. Let's put it in Really Bro. Uh, I think that's a very, very fair ranking. Um, you could argue it takes opponents off guard in Bullet. Or baits opponents into also playing a Bong Cloud, which just gives you a bit of an equal position. So, um, yeah, that's what we're going to say about that. Next up, Budapest Gambit. I used to play that myself, actually. And it was decent. Um, you sometimes got the weird, like, tricky checkmate thing. So you could argue it's tricks only. But even when your opponent doesn't fall for any tricks and goes for the main line, it's still okay. You don't get, like, a great position. But it tends to just be a little bit worse, which as the black pieces is still okay. So I'm going to put that at the bottom of legit. I think the Budapest Gambit is like a very good weapon online in Blitz and 
bullet. Rapid, it's playable, but not as viable. Classical, you might as well just play a better opening, but it's not bad. Next up, Karo Khan, legendary. Um, check out my Karo Khan playlist on my channel. My favorite opening of all time, um, safe to say. So that is in legendary, and it will be at the top of legendary, and I don't care what you have to say about it. Catalan, bruv, I'm putting it... I'm putting it in really, bro, and I'm going to put it below the bond cloud, simply because it's a great opening, but come on, be more imaginative. Like, I have... I've gone down that road myself with, like, Catalan-esque setups, but it's just so boring. Like... Put some pieces in the center. Don't just like do your little fianchetto thing and push your C pawn non-committal. Like, bruv, just play a proper opening. Besides, it gets kind of dominated by um the great snake variation from black, uh, which I've experienced when I have tried to play the Catalan slash English setup. And we're gonna put the English uh slightly above the Catalan, just because they're so similar in well, from what I know. Uh, I, I guess the Catalan includes like the gambiting of a pawn, so I would put that above the English because gambits are cool, but I'm also English, so the English is going to be above the Catalan because um, I'm still salty about the Euros. <laughs> um, I guess Catalonia technically isn't Spain, but it also is. So yeah, they're going to go in really, bro, just because when I play against them, I'm like, bruv, come on now. And I think a lot of people feel that way. Next up, we have the closed Sicilian. I'm going to be rating this from the white side because white chooses whether to go into a closed Sicilian. Black really has no say. I think it's very, very viable. I have played it in some classical games against lower rated players myself with very good success because you get to keep the center kind of closed, take people out of like just pure theory. Uh, obviously, there's theory attached to it, but not as much as like an open Sicilian from what I know about it. I've had good success in it. I'm going to put it at the top of legit. I think it's a very nice opening. You can learn some interesting lines, but at the end of the day, it just gives you a very playable chess game where you can try and push for an advantage and you're not going to like lose to some weird trick in the opening, maybe, hopefully. And I think we should get the Grand Prix out of the way while we're at it because the Grand Prix and the Close Sicilian tend to either have very similar ideas or transpose into each other. So with the Grand Prix, I'm going to put just above the Close Sicilian because it's got a really cool name. And also, I'm a big fan of playing uh, E4 and F4 together with the D3 pawn holding the center together. So that's what I'm going to do for that one. Danish Gambit, you are a chad if you play the Danish Gambit. It is pretty cool. Uh, it's not very viable. Mm. Okay, let me think about this. Rapid chess, classical chess, it's not really viable, right? Because you're just giving up too many pawns and black can defend themselves. Blitz and bullet, absolutely. It is a really, really good weapon. And as a 2000 rated player, to be honest, I would struggle against it in uh, blitz and bullet. And I actually do from memory. So I'm going to put it at the bottom of legit. Um, I think that's a very fair ranking for it. It, you know, it's very playable in faster time controls. If people know how to play against it, you're kind of screwed. But not many people really study up on it. And I've been playing chess for like years and I haven't really studied how to how to play against it. I kind of just think, oh, no one really plays the Danish Gambit and it's trash anyway. So if someone plays it, I'll just win because uh, I'm up a pawn or two. And that never really works out. So bottom of legit. Dutch defense. I'm going to put it at the bottom of Unbreakable. Now, you may disagree with me on that, but my reasoning is I see people have incredible success with the Dutch defense. Not only in like faster time controls online, but quite a few players at the chess club that I play at in person play the Dutch defense with, ab with amazing success. Because if you are a Dutch player, not the nationality, the opening, if you play the Dutch uh, a lot, then you know all the ideas. And again, it's one of those openings that people aren't going to dedicate loads and loads of time to studying. Whereas if you play it, you can kind of play it against pretty much anything that isn't E4. And the same kind of ideas are going to apply. It's not, it's not objectively 
an amazing opening. But from a practical standpoint, yes, absolutely. Bottom of Unbreakable. Exchange Karu Khan. Again, we're going to be taking this from the um, from the white side. I'm going to put it in the middle of Really Bro, and the Exchange French can go there as well. I know that when I play the Karu Khan as the black pieces, when someone plays the Exchange against me, it's just like, bruv. Bruv. Like... And th by the way, it's perfectly in really, bro, because that's the reaction. Are you really not going to try and push for an advantage? At the end of the day, it's just a dead equal game, and it's kind of boring. So, both with the Exchange French and the Exchange Karo Khan, I'm putting them in the middle of really, bro, above the English and Catalan, because I think they're really boring, personally. And the Exchange French and Karo are also boring, but at least you're putting pawns in the centre. That wins you some points with me. And as a bit of an anecdote, I think my first ever proper chess tournament in London, I think I came, I came joint third in it uh, when I was like, I don't know, 14, I think. Um, I played the Exchange French in... Or my opponent played the Exchange French against me, I think it was, in my first game. I won that game by some weird trick. Uh, but the game was actually kind of interesting, but it was because we were both rated like 1,400, so... Doesn't really count, does it? Next up, we have Fool's Mate. I'm just going to put it in garbage because, like, come on now. Four Knights Italian. It's not bad, but the problem is I'm going to put it in... I'm going to put it in tricks only because I'm going to take this from the white side. And the reason is of the center fork trick. Now, if you don't know what the center fork trick is, pull up a chessboard if you can't follow along the uh, notations. But E4, E5... Knight f3, knight c6, bishop c4, knight f6, knight c3. Knight c3 is just an inaccuracy because of knight takes e4. And if you then respond with knight takes e4, then you have d5. The best line for white is bishop d3, pawn e4, bishop e4, and black just has an equal game. It's a very silly, silly thing for white to do. You do not need to play knight c3 on the fourth move. You can play something like d3. You can play for the fried liver. And I would honestly say like the fried liver is better, even though you could argue that that's tricks only. Even if black knows the proper defense against it, it's still very viable in my opinion. So yeah, don't play the four, four knights Italian. French defense. This is obviously taken from the black side because black chooses whether to go into a French or not. I have mixed feelings about this. I'm English, as you can probably tell from my voice. So historical tradition would tell me to put it in garbage. However, this is an objective tier list. All of these rankings are 100% correct and you cannot argue otherwise. So, the French defense, uh, I'm going to put it just above the Danish gambit in legit because it is actually an okay opening. And a lot, I, I play the Karo Khan with the black pieces against basically everything, right? And the French defense, you often kind of transpose into French type lines. And I've got to be honest, they're actually quite fun. So the, I think the French gets a bad rap, a bad rap for the fact that the light squared bishop can't get out. But it's honestly not that big of a deal. I, I really don't think it's a big deal. As a 2000 rated player, if you're rated below me, like, don't be worried about your light squared bishop not being able to get out because not every single one of your pieces needs to be doing like an absolute madness every game. So I would, I would put that... Yeah, in, in legit. Maybe I'll move it up a little bit, actually. I'll put it... Uh, I'll put it above the advanced Caro and the advanced French. I think it's actually kind of viable. So we'll have it in legit. The Fred, not going to lie, I actually don't know what that is. <laughs> and I cannot be bothered to look it up because it... Uh, just by the look of it, it looks absolutely stupid. So we're going to put that in garbage. Next up, Fried Liver. Fried Liver is a very legit opening. Even at, you know, a 2000 ELO uh, ra like rating, even in classical chess, you can play the fried liver and get away with it. Because the best way for black to defend gives up a pawn. And yes, black gets a lot of activity, but it's not obvious how black is actually going to create any kind of positional advantage from that. Because white can kind of curl up in a ball and be like, look, I'm up a pawn, bro. Like, what are you going to do about it? And there's a lot of theory attached to it as well. So if, as the white pieces, you learn that theory, 
you're doing pretty well. And obviously, if your opponent doesn't know that he has to give up the pawn on d5 and go knight to a5, I think it's called... I can't remember what the defense is called, like the proper name for it, but you guys know what I mean. Um, it's actually still completely viable for white, uh, even if black knows that. And if black doesn't know that, then it's pretty much winning for white. So I'm going to put that in legit above the advanced French and the advanced Caro because it's way more exciting. So that gets brownie points with me. I'm going to put it just below the French defense because I think the French has more uh, substance to it. But it's still a very legit opening. Next up, Joko Piano. I mean, the Joko Piano, like the Italian game, um, same thing. It's a great opening. I think I used to play it back in the day when I started playing chess, mainly because I wanted to get the fried liver. But when you had um, e4, e5, knight f3, knight c6, bishop c4, bishop c5, uh, the main line of the Italian... I mean, you have, like, the Evans Gambit with b4, you have, like, moves like c3, you have the closed variations with d3, you can castle immediately. The problem that I used to run into is that black would just mirror white, and you'd get incredibly boring positions if black, uh, like, wanted to, or if white didn't go for some kind of gambit line. So, I would say it's, it's of course, a viable opening. But I would argue that it's a little bit boring if you don't play one of the Gambit lines. And because, you know, if, if it said Evans Gambit, then I'd say it's more exciting. But it's only saying Joko Piano, uh, like, actually on the card. So it's definitely a legit opening. I'm going to put it... Mm, I think it has to go above the fried liver, but below the French defense, because it's less exciting, in my opinion. Next up, the Grob. The thing is with the Grob... It's not that bad because nobody knows what to do against it, right? It's one of those openings, like I was saying with the Dutch. Now, it has to go, it has to go below the Dutch defense because the Dutch is more viable, right, from an objective standpoint. But people don't know how to play against the Grob. If someone played the Grob against me, I would not have a clue. It's one of those openings where you can learn the theory, no one else is going to study the theory, and although it's objectively a bad opening, you know the lines. So you know what, I'm, I'm going to put it at the bottom of legit. I think the Danish Gambit is better than the Grob because it's just simply more viable. But the Grob, it's not as bad as people think. It's not as bad as people think because people think it's bad. And therefore they don't study it. So I hope we're on the same wavelength here. Bottom of legit. Next up, the Grunfeld. I did play that for a little bit of time myself. I did not enjoy it whatsoever. It's incredibly theoretical. And I often got the... I, I often had the vibe when I played it as the black pieces that if white knew what they were doing, you had nothing. So it's a good opening. I just think it's very boring and unimaginative. Um, unless you have an absolutely incredible knowledge of theory. I think it I think it has to go into unbreakable though because it's so viable at all Yeah, at all levels. If you know the theory, it's very viable. I just don't like the fact that it's so insanely theoretical, but that's just a personal thing. Like objectively it is a very good opening. So, yeah, bottom of Unbreakable. I think the fact that so many Grandmasters play lines specifically not to allow the Grunfeld shows how powerful it is. Next up, the Hippo. I have played the Hippo in over-the-board classical chess against like 21, 2200 rated players and won games, had winning positions, drawn games, done incredibly well. It is very underrated in my opinion. It is... I'm going to put it at the top of legit. And that, that's not even a joke. Like, the Hippo, it is really good. And feel free to argue with me. Um, make whatever points you want. I am not budging on that. It is a great opening. Next up, the Italian. I'm really confused now, because isn't the Italian the same as the Joko Piano? Are they not just the same thing? Um... Right, okay, well, I'm just going to put it next to the Joko Piano because I swear it's just the same opening. Uh, maybe there's just, like, one move difference. 
maybe the Italian is after bishop c4 and the joker piano is after bishop c5. I actually don't know. So, yeah, you can see how much effort I'm pu I put into the preparation of this video. <laughs> okay, next up, Jerome Gambit. I actually know what that is. Um, I used to play it, and Aman is on the title card, so that gets bonus points. It's going in tricks only, but it's going to go above the Four Knights Italian, simply because Aman is there. King's Gambit, next up. I'm going to put it at the top of Really Bro. No, I'm going to put it below the Benoni. Below the Benoni in Really Bro. Because, again, it's one of those openings where if you know the theory, it's actually pretty decent, especially in faster time controls. The slower time control you go to, the less viable it becomes because Black has more time to think about how to counter it. But, you know, if, if you know the theory and you're playing it in like a one minute, three minute, five minute game, Black doesn't have enough time to think about what to do and probably hasn't booked up on it quite well enough. So I'm going to put it, yeah, just below the Benoni. I think the Benoni is a bit more solid, so therefore it's higher on my list. But the King's Gambit, it's not bad. Next up, King's Indian. Um, The King's Indian I played for about four years. Uh, of my chess career. I don't know if I'd call it a career, but time playing chess. And it served me very well. Like, it has been a feature of some of my, like, biggest wins. Uh, like, I remember I played the King's Indian in a over-the-board classical chess tournament in the final game. There was, like, 20 people crowded around because this was the game to decide um, who came first, who came second, who came third. Because I was like joint second going into the last round against first place. I played the King's Indian. The opening objectively didn't go amazingly. But because the King's Indian is so dynamic, I ended up winning. It was pretty cool. I think I've got a video on the channel about it. But uh, actually, yeah, I'm sure I do. I just can't remember what it's called. Um, anyway, the King's Indian is decent. I think I've, I've stopped playing it now because I feel like it's... I feel like it just isn't good enough if white knows what they're doing this is the same with a lot of the openings here i'm gonna put it mm, just below the budapest because it is obviously a legit opening but the higher up in the elo you go the harder it becomes to get anything from it i know players like hikaru um bobby fisher play played the King's Indian with great success, but I feel like modern engines have really made it difficult to get anything from King's Indian positions. So that's that's where I'm going to put it. I think I'm being generous there. And it's because I love the opening uh, from a emotional standpoint, but objectively, I think that's where it belongs. Next up, King's Indian attack. So that's basically the King's Indian, but with the white pieces. It's a lot more viable with the white pieces. I'm actually going to put it... A above the Grunfeld in Unbreakable because I feel like it is somewhat like the English and the Catalan except way less nerdy <laughs> and I think you get more exciting positions because you can go for the massive kingside attack um, in the King's Indian attack, hence the name but it's not easily countered compared to the King's Indian from the black side because white is just simply a move ahead so that's where I'm going to put it. I think it's a really legit opening. And I have used it myself a bit to decent success. Latvian Gambit next up. Now, my surname is Lithuanian. So I know very random. But that means that I should have a bit of love for the Latvians. Fellow, um, fellow boys up in that region. For s the Baltics. For some reason, I couldn't think of the word. <laughs> anyway, the Latvian Gambit. It's not bad. It's not bad. Um, I, yeah, I believe it's e4, e5, knight f3, f5. And it looks really silly, but it's actually a decent opening. Um, I'm going to put it... I'm going to put it above the King's Gambit in Really Bro, because it's not terrible at all um, from a practical standpoint. From an objective standpoint, the engine obviously hates it. But who studies Latvian Gambit theory from the white side? If I faced that, I'd be like, bruv, bruv, like, I'm just going to play something like D3 and be safe, you know? Because it's difficult to know really what to do. I actually don't know what the move is on the third move for white. 
I'm 2000 rated. I've been playing chess for like 10 years. Um, I've been playing like online for like seven years. And I don't know what I would do against the Latvian. So legit, almost legit, almost legit. Next up, London system, garbage. Martial attack. Um, the martial attack is great. Now, personally, I don't like playing into the Roy Lopez uh, from the black side. But if you do, the martial attack is fantastic. If you don't know what it is, highly recommend searching it up. It really helped me out in a lot of games when I used to play E4, E5 from the black side. I would, I would say play the Karo Khan from the black side if you face E4. Or indeed, if you place, face d4 or c4 or knights f3 or g3, I have a playlist uh, dedicated to the Karo Khan versus everything. Quick little plug. Really cool playlist. You should check it out. Anyway, martial attack. If you are going to play e5 against e4 and you do go into a Roy Lopez, the martial attack is your best weapon. I'm going to put it above the Grunfeld. Now, white can avoid going into the martial. So many top grandmasters play anti martial lines because if you get the martial and you know the theory, it's basically a draw or black wins. You know? And it's also really, really fun. So, yeah, I am very happy with putting it there. Next up, the Nidorf. Now, the Nidorf, there is so much theory, but it's also incredibly exciting. And if you know the theory, then you can have a great time. You can also have a terrible time though, because there's just so much going on and white can get some insane attacks as well. But very exciting positions can arise from the Nidorf, and it's not like the engine has debunked this opening whatsoever. It has added, added so many new layers of depth. It is still absolutely viable. It doesn't get played quite as often anymore at the top level, but I'm not talking about top level chess. The Nidorf is great. I'm going to put it at the top of legit, now, it's only the top of legit if you learn the theory, but it's a really good opening. Next up, Nimzo Larsen attack. Now, again, one of the um, one of the players at my chess club, well, actually my captain for last season where we, we won the second division, it was great. He plays the Nimzo Larsen. <laughs> With great success, again, I have played against him where he's played the, Lim the Nimzo Larsen, and I think we drew that game, but I had studied up massively because I knew he was going to play it, and I could only get a draw, and I probably should, I definitely should have lost, I got a really lucky perpetual check. Um, I'm going to put it, I think it has to go in legit, it has to go in legit, I'm going to put it, hmm... Um, Above the Italian, because I think it's more interesting, but below the French, because I think the French, again, has more substance, has more excitement. But the Nimzo Larsen, very viable. If you don't know what it is, search it up. Petrov, boring, but solid. I have to put it in Unbreakable. I'm going to put it above the Grunfeld, um, just, just because I want to. In all honesty, <laughs> I feel like it can't be at the bottom of Unbreakable. The whole point of this opening is to be Unbreakable. That's the point of the Petrov. So it has to go there. Uh, it's just incredibly drawish from the black side. And that's the whole point of it. So yeah, it's Unbreakable. Next up, the Philidor defense. The Philidor, it's okay below like a 17, 1800. But once you start getting towards 2000 and above, it's completely unviable. It just doesn't offer enough. You block in your bishop. You don't really grasp the center like you should be doing. I'm going to put... I don't know. I think... I would put it in tricks only. But there's not really any tricks. There's not really tricks in it. Maybe there is. I'm going to put it at the bottom of tricks only. I'm sure there's some weird lines in the Philidor. But all I know is weird lines against the Philidor with white. The... um. I think the legal trap, um, that's against the Philidor, and it's incredibly satisfying if you manage to play it. Um, so learn what that is if you play E4 with the white pieces, because it's really cool. But yeah, it's, it's just not a good opening. Next up, the perk, or the peers, however you're supposed to pronounce it. Also, that's a hilarious photo of um, Perk, the man. <laughs> um, I'm pretty sure he was around like late 1800s, early 1900s. The perk is alright. I think it's 
somewhat similar to the Philidor in my head, except a little bit better. I'm going to put it at the top of tricks only, because it suffers massively against, like, the, um... Oh, what's it called? The 150 attack, for example, which is an absolutely awesome attack from the white pieces. If you play the perk, if your opponent plays the one the ten, the 150 attack, it is just so difficult to play, and you just you need to take more control of the center. You know, I don't think it's that good. You can get some interesting counterplay on the queen side with moves like c6, b5, a5. If um white castles queen side. But just play a normal opening. Just play a normal one. Next up, the Polish. Uh, the Polish, I believe, is um, B4 on the first move. I actually played against the Polish in on, on the YouTube channel, and I struggled massively against it. It is a decent opening, even though objectively it is bad, which puts it in the same kind of tier as the Danish and the Grob. I think it's better than the Grob. I think it's a bit worse than the Danish. It's basically the Grob, except mirrored, but better because you're committing a queenside pawn rather than a kingside pawn, meaning your king is safer in this variation. I think it's a little bit better known than the Grob, but also a bit better than the Grob, like objectively. So it's going to go slightly above it. Next up, the Ponziani. Can I actually remember what the Ponziani is? I'm actually going to have to search this one up because I should know this. Okay, so the Ponziani is e4, e5, knight f3, knight c6, c3. It's not bad. It's not bad. You can always transpose into different openings. I'm sure you can transpose into like the Italian or the Roy Lopez or just go for a really closed position with like d3. Maybe go for a King's Indian attack with like d3, g3, bishop, g2. I'm, I know there's lines with like queen a4 after like d5, but... It, it's it's a legit opening. It is legit. I think it's a little bit... Maybe it's not boring. I feel like there is actually a lot to it. I know players like Eric Rosen play it, and Eric Rosen does not play boring openings. So I cannot say it's boring. I just don't have a good enough knowledge on it. I'm going to put it above the French. Below the close Sicilian and the Grand Prix, though. Because I think they're more legit. Okay, next up, the Portuguese Gambit. So the Portuguese Gambit is um, like with the Scandinavian defense. And it's actually a pretty good opening. Even at a classical level, even at a 2200 level, it's decent. I've seen people play it over the board. Um, I've started playing Bishop B5 check lines against it to try and diffuse the excitement. Because I don't know the lines and I don't want to study the lines. So it's, it's definitely a legit opening. Now, where in legit would we put it? I think, I think it probably goes just above the Nimzo Larsen. Just above the Nimzo Larsen. I think that's a fair ranking. Let me know if you disagree with that, but I think that's decent. Queen's Gambit next up. I don't even know who that is on that photo. Um, maybe I should know, but I have no idea. Um, the Queen's Gambit, I mean, I'm personally not a fan of it. But it is just a good opening objectively. So I think I have to put it at the bottom of Unbreakable. Just because it's a good opening. And everyone plays it. So clearly it's good. I hate it. But it's good. Next up the Reti. The Reti is just boring. Like it is so boring. But it transposes into everything. So again it has to be an Unbreakable. I'm going to put it above the Queen's Gambit. Because I hate 1d4. <laughs> You know, everyone is a 1e4 a one or a 1d4 lover. I'm a 1e4 lover, 1d4 hater. So, yeah, the Reti at least can transpose into more fun openings. But just play e4. Play e4, it's cooler. The Roy Lopez. The Roy Lopez is just so good. It has to be top of Unbreakable. It's an amazing opening. There's so much theory to it. But you can also take your opponents out of mainline theory if you want. It just gives white so many options. There's so much theory involved if you want to learn it, but you don't have to, which I think is a great uh, part of the opening. I played the Roy Lopez as the white pieces up until like, up until like 1800, and it served me incredibly well. Very interesting positions. Everyone plays it from the bottom of the elo ladder to the top of the elo ladder. So unbreakable it is. Not legendary, 
Maybe it should be legendary. Actually, it should. It should be below the Karo, though, because the Karo is the goat. Next up, the Scandi. I'm going to put it at the top of Really Bro. It's a viable opening, but like, it's, it's just be more imaginative. If you play the Portuguese Gambit version, then okay. I'm, I'm cooler with that. But, bruv, just play a more fun opening, please. Next up, the Scotch. The Scotch is very legit. It's boring again, in my opinion, but it's legit. So I think I have to put it... I'm going to put it below the fried liver. Um, I think it is actually decent for the white pieces. It's, I used to find it very frustrating to play against as black. Actually, I might have to put that in Unbreakable, you know. I'm actually going to put it in Unbreakable because it is just so easy to play and so playable at all levels of chess. Let me know if you disagree with that one. I think that might be a more controversial one. But I think, I think that's a very fair ranking. Next up, Sicilian. Legendary. Um, I might not like the Sicilian personally. I don't like playing it. I don't play it. But it is just objectively an incredible opening. And I'm going to put it below the Roy, uh, the Spanish, because I'm more of a fan of the Spanish. And obviously the Caro is the goat, so that stays at the top. But the, the Sicilian is great. Um, and I also have some Italian ancestry. So um, I know Sicily is technically its own thing. But yeah, we're going to put it there. Also, Sicily was the um, like main place for a lot of the first Punic War. And the Punic Wars are my favorite war ever. So if you don't know about it and you like history, search it up. The Punic Wars are sick. Especially the first one, which gets overlooked a lot. Okay, Sicilian Dragon. Now, I'm going to put the Sicilian Dragon and the Accelerated Dragon in a pretty similar spot because they're very, very similar, of course. Um, the, dra the Sicilian Dragon and the Accelerated Dragon, the main difference, though, is that the Accelerated Dragon has a way cooler name. So I think they have to go and legit. I'm going to put them just above, just above the Italian, because uh, one, they have a cooler name. Two, I think they're more exciting, and the Accelerated goes above the Sicilian dra the regular Sicilian dragon, because, bruv, that's a picture of a dragon, that's a picture of pizza. Pizza is great, but dragons are cooler. Next up, the Slav. Legendary. Just below the Caro. Again, objective. You can't argue with that. Smith Mora. I used to play the Smith Mora. Fantastic opening. Great results in fast time controls, slow time controls against lower rated opponents, higher rated opponents. There's theory involved. You don't have to learn all the theory. Very exciting. Amazing. The only flaw is that after E4, C5, D4, CD4, C3, black can play D3 and take away all the fun. So it's going to get dropped a bit because of that. I'm going to put it just above the scotch. It would be higher. It would be at maybe the top of Unbreakable or bottom of Legendary. But that D3 line is so annoying. I used to hate it. That's one of the main reasons I stopped playing it, to be honest. That I have to drop it a bit. The Sodium Attack, I have no idea what it is. I'm going to have to search that up now. Okay, it looks like the Sodium Attack is Knight A3. So, okay, that's going in tricks only. Actually above the Philidor, because the Philidor is boring. At least the Sodium Attack has a cool name. Stonewall, I'm going to put that up with the Dutch. Uh, I think it has to be up with the Dutch, because it's very, very similar. And, yeah, they, they could be interchangeable, but the same things apply. Great opening. Last up, we have the Tarash French. We're going to take this from the white perspective. Um... Because again, white chooses whether to go into the Tarash. That is e4, e6, d4, d5, knight, d2. I used to play this. I had some incredible success with some very, very in-depth lines. But if black didn't play into those lines that I prepared, I didn't love it. I know it's one of the most viable ways to play against the French though. So it's going to have to go in Unbreakable, I think. I'm going to put it above the Reti. And just below the Grunfeld. I think that's a fair ranking. And this is the completed tier list. So let me know what you think of this in the comments. Whether you mostly disagree. Whether there's some very controversial ones that you disagree with. But, you know, I, I think this is pretty decent. 
check out the other videos on my channel if you enjoyed this one. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you in the next video.